Oh. Okay, got it. All right, good afternoon, everyone. It looks like most folks have connected. Um, so welcome, it's Wednesday, it is Heroes Connect Day, it's Heroes Connect Day, right? So my name is Katie Bowerman, I'm a Senior Program Manager for the Manufacturing Institute, and I oversee the Virtual Heroes Make America Military Skill Bridge Training Program. Um, today's presentation is featuring a super cool company and one of our sponsor companies, Howmet Aerospace. Aerospace is one of those industries that many folks that I know when I talk to service members shy away from because they think um, that they have to be a pilot or an engineer, and that's the only way to get into this sector of the industry, but that's simply just not true. There is a whole army of folks working to get necessary components of those aircrafts manufactured every day so that those pilots can fly them. So I'm excited to have you all learn more about this advanced manufacturing company and how they could be a part of your next career chapter. Before I go ahead and introduce our first speaker um, and get to know more about this sector of the industry, I briefly want to cover some guidelines just to make sure that we're all on the same page. First off, the event is being recorded and will be sent out as part of an event recap email. Um, you should have been automatically muted upon entry, but if you did not, if you can just make sure you stay muted um, throughout the presentation to avoid any background noise. And then lastly, I encourage you all to be active participants. There is a chat feature. So if you don't know where that is, you go into control panel, hit chat. That is where we will be dropping in any questions that you have throughout the presentation. We'll hold questions until the end, um, but we'll come back to that chat box and look through everyone's questions during the Q&A portion of the presentation. At that time, I'll also let everyone use the raise hand feature. So if you did want to come on and ask a question live, we will do that during the Q&A session as well. But overall, it's events like these that provide you this opportunity to join the discussion with industry folks so the people who work at the company the experts in this industry utilize this time to ask them questions um, so that you can make a better decision as to what type of companies you want to apply into post separation from the military right so use this time before we go ahead and pass it off, I also want to talk about Heroes Make America just for a second, right? The Manufacturing Institute's Heroes Make America Military Skill Bridge Program. Um, we have many students on the call right now, but we also have other military affiliated partners, uh, company representatives, community folks from across the country joining us today. So for those of you who don't know what Heroes Make America is, we're actually a DOD approved skill bridge program for transitioning service members, veterans, and active duty military spouses. We provide a variety of certification trainings, as you see here that go towards the manufacturing and supply chain industries. Our students learn a variety of topics to include safety, quality practices, um, various technical trainings like electrical, mechanical, and pneumatic training. And then we also have a logistics training. It really just depends on the location that our students are training with. So you can see here our program managers, the certifications we offer, upcoming class states for 2023. Uh, we will also drop in our program managers contact information into the chat. So if you do have any questions, you can reach out to any one of us. But without further ado, let's move on to the main feature. I want to first introduce Cindy Penny, Vice President for Talent and Organizational Effectiveness at Helmet. So Cindy, the floor is all yours. Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to talk to you about Helmet Aerospace because I really think that moving into an industry and a company like ours is a perfect next step for people coming out of service. And I want to make sure that you all know what you'd be missing if you didn't come along and work for us and just tell you a little bit more about, about the company. So first of all, quick introduction about myself. Um, I've uh, been with Halmet. We used to be Arconic. We used to be Alcoa, but you know, this you know, we've been working in um, aerospace and manufacturing parts for airplane manufacturers for a very, very long time. I talk about as some um, being an 80 year startup as far as uh, the jet engine business is concerned. Um, for, from your perspective, I've put a little bit more in here about my job, um, but from your perspective, I'm actually responsible for talent acquisition, career development, mm -hmm. and, and general learning within the organization. So I think that's probably what's interesting. I wanted to tell you a little bit about my, my education because I started life wanting to be a librarian. I then went on and became a teacher. And then I sort of moved across into HR and talent. And I wanted you to be aware that you can start in one place and move to another. 
you don't have to be stuck somewhere. And people often think that they have to be niched into something. And you certainly don't have to be. And it's good to have different experiences. I also held different those different roles across different industries. And again, people think they've got to be pigeonholed into one particular industry. If they go into healthcare, they've got to be into healthcare. Um, it, you don't. So go where your passion leads you and go where your skills take you. If you're good at something, you'll be good at that anywhere. And I just want you to be really clear on that as you move through into the next phase. Um, my career highlights, and again, when you're doing your resume, really pick out your highlights. Mine are that I, I, I worked, I was on a select committee with the UK government telling them about how retailers could improve disability access. Um, and I worked for who is now King Charles, helping him develop um, direct diversity and gender equality for the top companies in the UK. Um, still sends me Christmas cards. I hope I get one this year now that he's a king. <laughs> um, so put your highlights and put them if they're personal, put them if they're to do with something that you've done within your career. Make sure people know that you've done things to be proud of. And then finally, my personal highlights. Um, I represented England uh, in, in table tennis. Now, people think that's a little minor sport, but it's a good sport. And uh, I'm proud to have represented my country. Been married 46 years and I'm very difficult to live with. So I'm not sure who should take the credit for that one. Um, super proud um, of my children as well. Um, I should be. They're very nifty. One's a TV presenter. One does special effects makeup. And the biggest thing that I've done most recently is moving to the US from the UK. And those of you who have been deployed overseas know that that can be quite um, different from day to day. Underpinning everything I've ever done is the fact that, you know, I'm my dad's daughter. You can see him here. He was in the Royal Navy for 22 years. He got deployed for two years to Hampton in the US. He was in Sydney for the Australian Navy for a couple of years and even Canada, and most people don't even know Canada had a Navy, but you know we went all over the world with him in his role in the Royal Navy. And that literally is underpinned because his message to me was, be the best you can be, study and grow all the time, and don't let the grind you down. Um, so if we move on to telling you a little bit about how I met, got a short video clip for you to get a feel for one of the plant environments. So uh, we are an iconic and trusted brand. We're not known by the public because we literally market our products to manufacturers of airplanes, industrial gas turbines, uh, those sorts of things. So we are, we are known and are in the leading position for key aerospace and commercial transportation markets. Um, that's because we have got differentiated technology. Nobody can do some of the things that we do in terms of making you know, strong alloy products. And we've got proprietary technology that protects us in terms of being the only manufacturer of those things. And we are literally mission critical to most airplane manufacturers. And we're able to provide over 90% of their structural and rotating aero engine parts. So those are the, the main things that we do. And we're nose to tail on most commercial and military defense aircraft. 
every time anybody I know goes and gets on a plane, I always say, you know, we're on your plane. Literally every plane that you're likely to get on, our products are likely to have, you know, be powering it and be holding it together. So it, it really is an all encompassing manufacturer of aerospace parts. Um, if you move to the next slide, uh, it sort of tells you about our size. We're a global company. Um, we've got, um, we actually now got nearly, we've got 60 locations in 20 countries and we're up to about 21,000 employees because we have been hiring hard since the pandemic. Um, our revenue, this is last year's revenue. This was during the pandemic when most organizations sort of went a little bit quieter and aerospace certainly reduced a lot and we still were making $5 billion in revenue. Most of our market, 44%, is that commercial aerospace that I talked about. Defense at the time of this slide last year was 17%. It's up to 24% now and I think we can blame things like the Ukraine war on that. Um, but the defense market is a very you know, big industry for us and growing all the time. So we're a very large company with a you know, number of locations. Um, if we move to the next slide, um, you'll see that um, we have four separate business units or segments, we call them, which is how um, we're able to sort of service, you know, nose to tail on, on planes. Um, across all of them, you'll see we're the market leader. And, you know, that's the market leader. And we have customers, you know, like Rolls-Royce, Boeing, Airbus, uh, Lockheed, all the biggest manufacturers are using our parts and we are number one. Uh, we also make forged wheels for the commercial vehicle market. And again, we're number one there. We literally make the lightest wheels that can be manufactured. The, the benefit being that they're also really strong. And I think that I want to really hammer home. We are the market leader. Why wouldn't you want to work for a market leader? Um, if we move into the next slide, start to tell you a little bit about each of the businesses. Engine Products, which is actually the business that I joined initially, um, is our largest. Um, and they are making those aerospace engine parts. And the pride that we have in those is because of the technology we have, we're able to make them quieter, cleaner, and more fuel efficient um, than any other manufacturer, which all helps to keep the planet a little bit cleaner and actually saves money for those commercial engines in terms of fuel. Um, we, we literally are growing um, all the time. And just for this particular business, their market is 23% air um, defense. That's grown this year and they've included NASA in their customers this year. So we're on rockets as well, which were, you know, that's new because it's always about forward looking. Um, our next company on the next slide is our structures. Um, most airplanes nowadays, they want to make out of composites because they're lighter and more fuel, more fuel efficient. The issue when you use composites, if you've got to have a really strong structure, uh, pinning that up, and, and, and that's literally what we do with them. And we particularly collaborate with the, the military because um, they need to really have planes that are strong. So if we think about um, the F-35, you're, you're veterans, so you know this, but I normally tell members of the public, if you've seen the Maverick film and the jet planes, they were fine, they're ours. You know, we, we, we are the only people who are providing the parts for those planes. And they're working on the next generation of those. And we've already got orders going through 15, 20 years to be able to provide those. So they really rely on us and nobody else for mission critical applications. Um, the next business is a little different. We're moving away from the engine parts and we're looking at fasteners. And our fasteners, um, again, used across every part of every plane, everywhere. We actually invented a type of fastener that were composite and could move lightning strikes across the plane. So, you know, we were the first company that came up with that. We still hold the innovative technology for that. So it was much safer for, for organizations. And we invented that because of these composites. You, need, you know, normal rivets and fasteners didn't work on composite. We invented something working in partnership with air, air, airplane companies 
to make something that they needed for future generations. So we're very innovative in terms of um, what we do. And we literally work with partner clients to, to find out, okay, what are you gonna need for the future? Um, the other thing about our fastening systems is they're now starting to be used on things like solar energy farms. They're able to clip together um, panels of, for solar farms. So again, looking to the future, looking at different markets that we can use. Um, and then the last company that we have in our, in our portfolio is our wheels. Again, number one in this, uh, commercial transportation. If you see trucks out on the road with shiny wheels, they're ours because we invented some technology uh, called Durablite, which keeps the wheels super shiny. I only wish that we got them for normal cars because I hate cleaning my car. Um, and they are literally used everywhere because they save weight, which saves fuels. And they're also very easy to maintain and swap about on, on trucks. So it keeps their fleets on the road much more effectively. Um, and then my last slide that I wanted to share with you is just this sort of reminder that all of these changes that we've been making um, have been very much around uh, making sure that you know, environmentally, the impact of air travel and commercial transportation is limited uh, in terms of you know, carbon footprint. Um, also, minimizing operational impact because the, the items that we give them are easy to fit, easy to change. So they use less energy in operating plants. Um, as a company, we also think about people and you know, we have, um, the value in our people is something that you know, we're an 80 year old company. And, and generally when you find companies that have been around for a long time, they've got fairly old fashioned values in terms of respect and, in, and inclusion and, and working together as teams. And I think that's something that translates really well across to veterans. And we also are strongly embedded in our local community. So wherever our plants are anywhere in the world, we're, we're investing um, in the community to try and, and help with STEM education of children or any, any social impacts that are around there. The company support what we can. And most of our employees get actively involved in volunteering and we give time and support for them to do that sort of thing because those are, are really important values of the company. Um, not sure why anybody wouldn't come and work for us really. So I think you've probably got a slide on contact details there. Um, we have Facebook pages where you can take a look and see some of the activities that we get up to. We have, um, if you look on things like LinkedIn or Facebook, you see um, activities that our employee resource groups um, take an active part in. We have a veteran employee resource group. And I think that the panel members that you're going to talk to are huge supporters of that. And they do an awful lot of work in the community and in the, in the company um, to support veterans. And we're really grateful for them. And so I'll probably hand you over to the panels to find out about their careers. All right. Thank you, Cindy. Um, from our panelists, Arnold, do you want to go first and go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, yes, ma'am, it's fine. Um, hello, my name is Arnold Walker. I'm the uh, material manager for uh, our Savannah operation, where we primarily forge rotating discs for aircraft engines. Um, I did 21 years in the Army. I retired from Fort Stewart, which is pretty close to where we're at um, as a star in first class. Uh, 91 Mike, which is Bradley uh, Fighting Vehicle Systems maintainer. So. Thank you, Arnold. Let's see, Will, you want to go next? Yes. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Listen, uh, bear with me because we had a power shutdown, so I'm operating from my cell phone, okay? Um, but uh, good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is Will Dickens. I'm a retired Marine Corps Infantry Officer. I'm currently the Operations Manager at our Howmet Ranch Cucamonga facility, where we manufacture a super alloy and aluminum rings that encase engine components on the aircraft. Uh, I've been in this role for about four and a half years. Um, I started with the organization back in 2012, so I've 
taken on a variety of roles and I've grown from um, an entry level manufacturing engineer to the operations manager's uh, role. So that's where I am right now. Awesome, thanks Will. Henry, you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Henry Lewis. Um, I'm out of the uh, Cleveland, Ohio plant, um, uh, a manufacturing project manager, uh, our forging plant. Uh, we do a lot of the uh, aircraft blades, a lot of the large components, structural components uh, that you see on the uh, F-35. Um, Air Force, uh, active duty from 2000 to 2004, um, still an active reservist uh, out of Youngstown, uh, Air Force Base, um, been with Howmet for about about seven years now. Um, and uh, one of the things, Cindy, you mentioned, but I wanted to highlight, um, I've been able to participate in some of the school STEM programs um, and both some uh, continuous education uh, through the company, uh, both at uh, the University of Pittsburgh for Business Essentials and uh, down at MIT. Uh, for smart manufacturing certification. So that's just some of the things that HowMet um, does for their employees in the short period of time I've been with them. So Henry, do you mind going over the ERG group and then we'll bounce back to some questions for the panelists? Sure. Um, so I've been fortunate. So HowMet Aerospace, uh, we have about seven different ERG groups um, you know, throughout our global company. Um, I've been active in both the African Heritage Network, the Hispanic Network, and obviously the uh, Veterans Network group, um, our location specifically. So a lot of these ERG groups um, are uh, groups assembled both with salary, hourly employees, and even volunteers. But one of the cool things we do for the veterans, uh, every July, we go down to the VA hospital and we throw like a big um, cookout uh, for the veterans. and um, I was fortunate because I'm still in the Air Force to bring out our honor guard uh, to do a small presentation um, last year. And it's something that uh, both the uh, Union uh, Veterans Group and the HowMet Veterans Group um, really appreciate and something that we're gonna continue on moving forward. Um, so yeah, seven active uh, ERG groups uh, throughout the company. Um, and it's really how involved you wanna get um, in those groups in particular. Awesome. Thanks, Henry. Um, a question, well, I guess, Henry, I'm going to make you come right back on because I actually had a question because you mentioned that you're still in the reserves. Um, or, or Air Force Guard? Air Force Reserve. Air Force Reserves. How is that experience being in the reserves and working full-time for Helmet for those of our service members who may be considering going to the Guard or Reserves after? Um, as, so I can't speak for all locations, but my location has been uh, very flexible. Um, sometimes as a reservist, they ask us to work Fridays um, on our reserve duties. Um, and I've been given the liberty um, during those particular requests to go ahead and, uh, you know, meet my obligation with the military with no penalty to me at the uh, at my civilian job at How Met, um, along with obviously my two weeks a year. Um, that always, uh, that's never planned well in advance, but the company's uh, been more than uh, flexible um, and no conflicts associated with my military service. Perfect, thank you. So I'm gonna um, open it up to questions for the panel. So if you guys want to ask any questions, throw it in the chat box and I'll be reading them out as they come in. Um, I'll ask a couple questions to start us off. I guess for anyone on the panel, would you be able to describe um, any advice that you would give transitioning service members as they are preparing for their next chapter? So anything that you did well or hope that you would have done and that you didn't do, um, any advice that you have for our folks on the call today? Well, I'd like to add um, that one of the things that I did that worked really well for me is I started my transition process early, and I'm talking about 12 months or greater. Uh, and it made a big difference in my ability to make the connections, to get prepared both psychologically and administratively for the transition. So um, that was a big thing for me. And I'd encourage anyone to, my hope is that everyone here is starting their transition planning early. 
It does take time. It is an adjustment <laughs> to transition into the civilian world and just separate from something you've been doing for a long time. Um, yeah. How about for Henry and Arnold? Any advice um, for our folks? Well, I would um, I would say don't sell yourself short. Um, in my experience here, we have a lot of service members. Like you said, they don't they don't feel that they have the uh, the skills or the technical ability to work in aerospace because um, it seems so different from a lot of what we do. Um, and I didn't, when I introduced myself, I apologize, I didn't say it. I've been with Howmet for uh, 10 years, um, as of last week, as a matter of fact. Um, and I started at a lower level on the floor. Um, there's no equivalent to what we do here in Savannah to what the military does. So um, I've basically started from scratch um, I just took a chance, um, did the interview, and then uh, moved forward from there. But since then, I mean, I've moved team lead supervisor into management. So it's, there's a lot of opportunity if you just put yourself out there. Awesome. Thank you, Arnold. Um, I see several questions in the chat box. So Nicole or Karen, I don't know if we can, if you wanna to speak to the locations real quick and then we'll come back to more questions because that's already one of the um, big questions is what are the locations? Um, so if one of you wanna cover this slide then we'll keep going with the questions. Wait, wait, wait. Ooh. So we, as everybody can see, we have we have um, four different business units within HowMet. They're broken down by color on the map. Um, you can see, you know, we are kind of lumped together in the eastern side of the United States. But this gives you an idea of all of our locations broken down by our engines group, our fasteners group, wheels, and structures. Um, so if you're looking for a particular location, this is a great reference point for you if you want to, um, you know, maybe throw out in the chat where you're looking or what city you're in, what you're interested in. That is a great thing that we can have them do, Nicole, is if you all are, um, if you want to, in the chat box, throw in, where are you looking for, right? I did see someone looking for Alabama. I don't see a little dot on Alabama, but a question to that would be, are there remote opportunities? That's gonna, it would be specific, I think, to the, the position. Um, you know, a lot of our roles are gonna be hands-on roles that require you to be in the plant, but there could be um, opportunities where we might have a hybrid um, position for you. So it, it really would just depend on, you know, what they're looking for, what their background is, what's a, a good fit for them. Is there any tips on how to search for those remote jobs? I know some companies you have to search a specific way. Is it the location they put remote? Um, any tips on that if they are to look on the job post for that? I'm going to look on our careers page right now because I never look on the other side of things. Um, I, I know that there are some parameters that they can filter through so they can filter it through the type of position they're looking for, the state that they're looking for. Um, our careers page is a great resource. It's howmet.com slash join us. Um, and I think it's in the chat there, but that's a great starting point for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if, if you can hear me, okay. And I apologize. I Oh, you're, you're muted, Karen. Karen, you're muted. Okay. Um, we can, um, in the search functionality for, I'm sorry. I don't know why we're echoing here. I'll throw it in the chat. Okay. Um, yeah, you can search for function of job. You can also search for location um, and it will show a listing of all of those jobs based on your search. 
Um, I will say, and I see a lot of questions coming in related to, um, you know, to management positions, logistics, um, what type of roles we have available across the U.S. Um, there are, you know, I'd say about 60% of our roles are for our hourly production workforce. Um, and then we have a huge number of openings um, for engineering type roles. Um, and, and, you know, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, internally at, at Helmet and how um, some of the skills within the military and those transitioning over from military to civilian, um, just as our panel has, has discussed with you all, um, that are translatable to, um, you know, to the roles that we have here at Helmet. So um, one of the things that we're working on is um, looking at, um, you know, what those transferable skills are and how that equates to experience level for what we're looking for within our jobs. Um, but I would say primarily there are roles, um, you know, in our production sites across um, the United States uh, where they are plentiful um, and our engineering roles are plentiful. Um, we also have roles um, for those um, that are on the call where our corporate headquarters are in Pittsburgh. We have it highlighted um, it, as a star on our map, um, a lot of roles related to procurement, um, you know, um, and other corporate functions. Um, so if that is something that, um, that you've done in your military at your time within the military, um, they, you know, will have those type of opportunities in our corporate headquarters um, here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So um, again, apologies for the, um, for the echo. Um, but just wanted to make sure that was clear for some of the questions that came up in the chat. Thank you. And I guess to, to piggyback off of that, you had talked about you know, production and variety of roles that are available. Um, and we do usually have a group of folks on the call that are in the logistics supply chain side of the house. Um, mm -hmm. What does that look like in terms of positions? Uh, what are they called? What would they search for? Any advice for that logistics side? So I feel I, I feel like there is um, a drop down for logistics um, and quality type of roles. So um, I think you would just have to search in there. We have um, you know some of our logistics functions are related to just the plant. I don't believe that we have a centralized logistics function. Um, so you really have to go specific to the sites. Um, to see what's available at those sites, because it's very decentralized and it's it's plant specific. Yeah, I would suggest looking at um, like there, like you said, Karen, there is a quality um, drop down and then pro procurement might be a good spot to start at least, mm -hmm. um, you know, but there, there's over 500 open positions across the globe that are, you know, on our on our careers page. A lot of them are going to be general production jobs, but once you start to look in there, it go, you know you kind of go down a rabbit hole, and, and you'll be able to see all of all of the different um, roles that are available. But I would say for those that are interested in logistics, procurement might be a good spot to start, and then also um, maybe planning as well. It just depends mm -hmm. sometimes on the plant, like you said, the plant and how they um, you know are coding it in in the system internally. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. I We have found that sometimes um, we get bottlenecked, right? We're only typing in supply chain or only typing in logistics and we're not finding what we're looking for. So having that knowledge of what are the keywords to look for for this company are uh, crucial in the job search and making sure you're finding the positions. Mm -hmm. I do have a question specific for Will. Um, someone is looking, you know, to go on the operations side of the house. Um, I guess two full question when I'm add is one, do you have any advice for someone who's looking to be eventually become operations manager? So any advice on that piece? But then also could you describe a little bit more what all do you do as an operations manager? So what are some of your roles, responsibilities, things that you do in your position? Oh uh, yes. Let me start with the first part of the question. Is, I think if I understood and heard you correctly, is asking what what's to be expected or what skills are required if someone's looking for operations yeah do you have any advice for someone looking to become an or eventually become an operations manager um well I, I think military personnel have already developed a set of skills that are attributable to attributable to 
to success as an operations guy. One, you are focused, um, you can plan, you understand the concept of team, because that's really what it takes to work in operations, um, to, to bring people together as a team to accomplish the mission. So um, that's, that's, that's the first thing I'd, I'd say to you right off. Now, this, the second part of the question, I, I believe that I was being asked, uh, what, what is encompassed in my job? So for me specifically, and I'll talk about me specifically here at the Rancho facility, and, and some of it's general to anyone who's in operations in, in this manufacturing business. But the, I manufacture, I mean, I, I manage the operations process from raw material to shipping. So all of the departments that are involved in the manufacturing of the product that we make um, is what I oversee. I oversee those metrics that are relevant to the successful manufacturing of, of those parts. So anything from, um, what we call uh, revenue, which is a, is a big key metrics on the back end of the process once we get through. Um, that's what I really, really manage. And the quality of the product, um, how good or how well that product is being made. So those are just some of the things that uh, I do on a daily basis. Thank you, Will. On a side note to that, Karen or Nicole, are there any like management trainee opportunities um, or individuals usually hired right into supervisory roles? So we, do, we don't have a formalized management trainee program at HowMet, um, but we have plans in 2023 to develop um, a more formal early talent strategy um, that could include a management trainee program. It's not fully um, you know, developed and created yet. Um, but that is going to be need specific. Um, and, and we're in the very early stages of developing the overall strategy for early talent. Um, so I, you know, I don't want to say yes, and I don't want to say no, because it's, it's yet to be defined. Um, I think for our organization, it, we, we could absolutely benefit from a program um, such as a management trainee program, um, especially within our plants. Um, but we would have to get um, some, um, some early um, input um, from the businesses to make sure that it's, it's something that they, they need and require um, as part of the business needs. So, um, so it, could, it could be, um, but we're not, we're not there yet. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go back to the slide with our panel. I wanted to turn back to Arnold real quick. Um, same qu kind of question that I asked Will. What exactly do is what do you do as a four sheet supervisor? What does that mean? Well, uh, as for the four supervisors here in um, Savannah, um, schedule um, production in line with uh, with the product that we have available. Um, you have a six man crew, a team leader, five personnel that work for you. Um, and of course you manage the day-to-day -day operations, um, training, um, making sure that everything's done on time, the way we load and forge. So it's a, it's a busy job. <laughs> it is indeed. You're making a lot of parts. And then Arnold, um, question for you, another question for you, uh, for your progression, because I know we, I get a lot of questions about uh, what if I don't have a degree, right? What if I don't have a degree? Can I ever get into a supervisory role? Um, can you speak to your position a little bit in, in yeah, terms um, of that? Yeah, of course. So as I said, I started, I actually started on the floor as a heat treat uh, operator um, or technician is what we call it here. Um, and I spent about three years doing that. Um, I have a high school diploma and then, of course, my military background, uh, PODC, ANOC, um, BNOC, First Sergeant's course, that sort of thing, um, with no degree. Um, as I gained experience in the plan, of course, in Heat Treat, I became a team leader and then a supervisor for that department. Um, and then the, I got lucky, the departments combined between Forge and Heat Treat became one larger department. Um, so there were some opportunities there, of course, my experience and willingness to learn uh, helped push me into that. And then um, I did that 
for the better part of, uh, he treated Ford's the better part of eight years. And then the material manager position opened up and um, being in this plant for a long period of time, I know how this plant operates. So uh, I wanted to learn the other side of it, the supply side, how you receive the stuff in, order it, and then shipping. So um, I just, I applied for it, used my, uh, my background and the experience I gained in the plant. And uh, luckily uh, they gave me the position, so. Um, the other thing I will I will say, Katie, and, and this is Karen for all all of uh, all of you on the on the phone um, and on, at this event, um, I, I do want to say just to kind of further address the question of relevant ex experience versus a, you know a, a certain degree. Um, we we absolutely most especially in the plants um, are open to the relevant experience that could potentially replace the degree, um, especially those coming from coming from the military. Um, so, you know, as you're looking for, um, for roles, um, you know, please don't let that deter you from not applying because a, a lot of the times we will take that experience, um, as long as it's relevant experience, um, to substitute for that degree requirement. Hey, may I add just one additional thing that as I thought, as I listened to everyone, as I said, several of you, you coming out of the military, you already have a certain skill set. But as it relates to operations, the, the things and the skills that you're going to really need, is, and you do it every day. You plan, you supervise, mm -hmm. you organize, and you direct. I mean, there, it's a little more technical than that in terms of some of the activity that takes place here on the facility. But those four basic skills will get you through and create success for you in operations. Great advice. And then I also did throw in um, the talent acquisition email address. So if you guys do have any questions about specific positions or asking that question of, you know, it says degree or experience, what is that relevant experience? If you have those types of questions, um, you can go ahead and email that email address that I dropped in. Um, but great pieces of advice, because I think we have a lot of folks who see that requirement and automatically say, nope, and don't apply, even though they'd be a great fit. So I encourage you all to ask those questions, apply to those jobs. Um, let's see, I had some more questions, and I think this one's going to be probably specific to plant and or type of position. Um, but for those of you working in the plants, what are some typical shifts? Uh, what does that look like? Are they usually three, three, four on, four off? And what does that look like? So well, no R. At my facility, we, we operate uh, three shifts. First shift starting at five in the morning from five to one. Um, and then the second shift from one until 9.30. And then the third shift, what we call a graveyard shift from 9.30, nine at night until five in the morning. So. Is it five days a week or do they do like three oh, days yes. on, three days off? No, we, we uh, are five days per week, Monday through Friday. And occasionally we'll have overtime days on, uh, on a Saturday. That's appealing guys, because some manufacturers, you have to work three days through on three days off. So five day a week. That's appealing. How about Arnold? How about your plant? Are you also five days a week? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, we actually run 12 hour shifts, uh, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then, of course, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Um, we normally run Monday through Thursday. And then uh, our occasional overtime day would be Friday. So and that average is maybe maybe once or twice a month. But it's um, eight hour to 10 hour overtime instead of a full 12. Nice. How about Henry? How about your plant? Um, my plant is actually has three plants, uh, small aerospace, large, and the uh, wheels forging plant. Um, they do run three shifts, and then they also run um, two weekends a month, I think, for the hourly guys, where they are paid uh, time and a half and then double time on Sundays. Um, as a salary personnel in the engineering department, um, I have a pretty standard work week Monday through Friday. Um, seven to four, and then on occasion, depending on the project, um, I may have to come in on the weekends um, to cover a specific project or an installation. Awesome. And then, Henry, I'm going to stay on you a second. Can you, can you talk a little bit more to what do you do as an engineering lead? What does your team do? Sure. Um, so I'm a uh, 
manufacturing project uh, manager. So I've been at the company for six years. Uh, uh, I support a lot of maintenance activities. So I'll break down uh, my responsibilities in about three sections. So about 40% of my time, I'm supporting maintenance. About 20% uh, of my time, um, I'm supporting production. Um, this might be any additional tooling that they need, any improvements. Um, a lot of my projects has surfaced from um, suggestions and or ideas um, straight from uh, an hourly person on the floor. Um, and then I have my uh, capital projects, um, one that I'm currently working on, which is a robot cell uh, to take, you know, take away some of the um, ergonomic issues in a manual operation um, and turn that into a uh, robotic cell. So I'm taking the exact same individuals that conduct the work manually and I'm training them to run uh, the robot cell so they're not really losing their job. They're just enhancing their skills uh, within the same organization. So there's a lot of positive feedback for those type of projects, but the projects vary and the responsibilities vary and it just depends on what day of the week um, and what the uh, emergency is, if I'm being honest. Always a fire to put out. Um, I guess two things to follow up, Henry. One, uh, about the automation piece. I think there is a, you know, those that fear out there that automation is going to replace jobs, but I like that you just mentioned that you're upskilling the folks to work the automated pieces instead of replacing. Um, so I think that's something that I love that you mentioned. Um, another thing, Henry, oh, what was I? I think I lost what I was going to ask you. Oh, someone put it in the chat box about maintenance. You just mentioned maintenance. Um, you, you know, I oversee the maintenance. What does that mean in terms of you know, what do they do, uh, the maintenance crew? Right. So the maintenance, uh, you know, obviously you have uh, electrical skill trades and uh, what we call mill rights, mechanical skill trades that just supports the day to day um you know, functionality of the equipment. We, our facility is over a hundred years old. So we have a lot of old equipment. So um, some of the projects we're upgrading the equipment, um, collecting data, something that we weren't doing in the past. Um, so there's a lot of upgrades to equipment, improvements, rebuilds. Um, so in supporting maintenance, you know, it could be as simple as pulling up an old drawing for them um, and or modeling a new piece of hardware to retrofit into an existing piece of equipment. So um, the scope of supporting maintenance is pretty broad, but I will say that uh, my time as a maintenance technician, active duty for rescue helicopters, um, really kind of set that foundation, you know, to work hand in hand because it's essentially the same thing. Now, obviously these maintenance skill trades um, have specific training regarding the equipment, um, but the overall foundation and the basics are the same. Um, safety, how to use the tool, et cetera. So when you can bring that kind of synergy between engineering and the uh, skill trade, it makes for a more peaceful um, transition and or working environment when you have to put the two together. Awesome, thank you, Henry. Arnold, I'm gonna pass it over to you for a similar type of question since you come from a mechanic background also working on Bradley's. Um, are, is there any specific skill sets you look for um, in your mechanics or your maintenance crew at your site? Uh, mainly it's the same thing, uh, mill rights, um, and then a strong electrical and hydraulical background. Uh, anything in hydraulics uh, for what we do is look for a lot. And then if, I mean, some specialty stuff when it comes to CNC machining, but like I said, and I'll tell you, as far as applying for a job, <laughs> I always, I tell my guys here, and this is just my opinion, the worst thing you can do is, is get a job you're not qualified to do if you don't put it out there. You, you just, you know, put yourself forward and you can go along. Awesome, thank you. Let's see, a couple more questions have been popping up in the chat box. Um, one is in regard to relocation incentives. So I know you don't have locations everywhere in the United States, but if someone really is interested in working for Howmet, do you all provide any relocation assistance? We can, yes, dependent on um, the type of role um, and level of role. Uh, typically for our hourly positions, we would not offer relocation, but for um, many of our salary jobs, depending on um, you know, the type of relocation needed, um, we would be able to assist with that, correct. 
Awesome. Um, another question is in regards to specific certification. So if someone is trying to get into a managerial level position, are there any certifications that are, you know, good for them to have? So like a Lean Six Sigma, uh, OSHA, anything like that that you would recommend? I, I started to type something in the chat, but yes, uh, Six Sigma, um, any environmental certification. Um, I remember when I was active duty, I was part of the uh, HAZMAT group and I went through some specific training. A lot of that was able to be transferable um, once I got to this manufacturing site. Um, and just having the, um, just the background uh, with, with some of those certifications that we provide um, in the military. If you have the opportunity, um, keep all of those certifications or certificates um, and, and obviously add that to your resume. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see. I don't know if we will be able to speak to this, right? Because it may depend on location and type of position and all of that. Um, but are there average ranges for some of those hourly position, whether it's production, maintenance? Are you able to speak to any of those ranges? Yeah, I can't give you um, exact dollar um, amounts or per hour amounts because it does absolutely vary um, per location, um, the type of production role that it is um, and, and some other factors. But what I will say is, you know, given um, the difficulty in the labor market and the, and, and the labor market shortage, um, HowMet's done a really good job um, to increase wages where we see appropriate to, um, to keep it in line with the market demands. And so in a lot of our locations, we've made adjustments, um, probably like many other manufacturing companies or even hourly worker companies who hire um, hourly workers, but, but specifically in our, in our production sites, um, we've done a really good job to adjust um, to compete with the talent that's out there. So I can, I can assure you that in, in a lot of our locations, our pay for the hourly workers is very competitive. Um, and let's not um, forget about the additional perks of coming to join an organization um, such as HowMet that has not only your, you know, your base pay um, or, work, or your hourly, hourly rate, but um, all of the benefits that we offer all of our employees, including 401k, um, you know, your medical vision, dental, um, and things of that nature. Um, and then, of course, your annual increase is based on, um, on performance and things like that. So um, it's, it, you know, base pay, very important, um, but um, we offer a lot more things to make, um, you know, to make our, uh, our package as attractive as possible. Awesome. Thank you for clarifying that, Karen. Would you sure. be able to also quickly speak on promotability? Is there many times you see folks come in as like a technician one from the military, learn the position, and then they're moving up quickly from that prior, prior experience? Yeah, I, I think, um, so, you know, I think the members on the panel could probably better address the progression scale um, at the plants. I know that, um, that, you know, as an organization, we absolutely want our employees to be promoted for the work that they do and 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 try to um, align with their goals as well as the company goals in terms of where we want to go where the um, employee wants to go you know with their own career um, and so I will say on a very general standpoint that um, absolutely there's there's a ton of promotability not not only within your the BUs but across BUs. Um, so we, we want people to have um, that type of exposure to um, not only one particular business unit, but something um, outside of, of you know, where they came from. And so um, Arnie and, and Henry and Will, I don't know if you have any added flavor to that in terms of like the operational side of things, but um, I can say on a, on a very holistic perspective that um, we, we take progression in, in, in career very, very seriously here at HowMet and want to make sure people succeed and grow. Yes, absolutely. There's an opportunity. I held four different roles prior to taking on my current uh, role uh, that I have now, mm -hmm. but I started as a general manufacturing engineer. I took over um, safety and maintenance. Um, I had the heat treat facility that I was responsible for, and then I took uh, machining 
I was a machine shop manager for a couple of years, and then I finally grew into this role. So all of those roles were opportunities that helped lead me to the operations manager's job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll quickly add that um, I've been with How Met for three years and I've had three promotions. Um, I'm not saying that that's going to be everybody's case, but the background that we all held, hold as military veterans um, is definitely going to propel us to the front of the line when it comes to promotion. If you just continue to exhibit those skills that you learn on, on, on the, uh, on, in the armed forces. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Well, I know we are at time. We started a few minutes late, so we're going to go a few minutes late. Um, but I want to stop here. We have really good questions. Um, I don't want the conversation necessarily to stop here, right? We've dropped in all of our uh, presenters' <laughs> contact information into the chat box. Um, so be sure to connect with them on LinkedIn, follow up, ask those questions. We dropped in the email address for the talent acquisition team. Um, the more you know, the more prepared you are for the job search. So I want to, again, thank everyone today. Any final words from our panelists before we wrap up our very last slide? Uh, yes, I'd like to say, hey, thank you guys for being here. I think it's, it's a fantastic opportunity to, to, uh, for us to share with you our experiences and uh, provide any feedback or questions to you that you may uh, have, uh, you may want to present to us. Um, thank you very much for that. We, we enjoyed it. And uh, I'm hoping to hear from some of you all. Uh, my contact information is available. So please reach out to me anytime you like. Uh, same as well. Um, I put my uh, email on in the chat. Um, but I think you guys also have my contact information. I'm actually working from home for the next uh, five weeks due to a ACL knee surgery. Um, so I have time to answer questions um, and or provide any more details for anybody um, that's on the uh, on the call. Yeah, and I would say the same here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I enjoyed it. Um, and then feel free to contact me um, and I'll, uh, I'll help and answer any questions that I can. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you all. Okay. So the next steps, connect with these folks, follow How Met on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, all the channels, connect with our Heroes Make America team. Um, like I said, these are experts who are willing to donate their time to talk with you all, make sure you're successful in your transition. So that's a wrap for our How Met. Uh, I put up a poll to make sure, so if you make sure you answer that before you leave. And then don't forget to join us next week for our Heroes Connect event on November 4th. We will be hosting St. Goban. They are a, um, they started as a mirror producer and now they produce a, a variety of construction materials. Um, so we'll hear from the, them next week. So thanks, How Met. No Thank you everyone for joining us. And that's a wrap. We will see you all next week. Thanks everyone. All right, take care. Pleasure. Bye. Bye.